Good morning, everybody. I heard the beep, so he must have did it. Yeah, okay. We're Brian Bible Church, Grace Life Church. Again, we're located in Evansville, Indiana, P.O. Box 6033. And again, this is my phone number. Uh, I, I said in, in Sunday school, if you're going to send me a message, do it over text in this phone number. Don't do it over Instant Messenger. Don't send me a text over YouTube and, and comment section. Do this, and I'll probably see it a lot quicker and respond to it eventually. Um, sometimes it's not immediate, but within a day or two, I will get back to you. On Wednesday, we have a program called Grace Life Unleashed Podcast with Pastor Dave playing chess in a checkers world. And uh, we're going through Romans and also talking about current events and just applying it to our, our grace life. Um, last week, we started talking about our gospel. And this is actually part two of last week's message because we didn't get through it. But we got to remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not the mystery, but it is the gospel. So we need to understand that. If, if, if you only know one thing, this is what you want to know. But the, the mystery is not Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and rose again. It's what was going on behind the scenes is what's important. So people need the gospel. You know, whether you've heard the expression, there's a hundred things that happen at the moment of salvation. You ever heard that? Whether you know them or not, they're going to happen. Okay? Whether you understand the mystery completely or not, it's still going to happen. But if you don't understand the gospel, you're not saved. So if you're going to tell people one thing, it, please tell them that Christ died on the cross for their sins, was buried, and rose again. And as we talked about in Sunday school, there's a problem going on today where, where people do not believe in the lake of fire. Well, if you don't believe in the lake of fire, what are you being saved from? You don't need salvation. And so people actually are, are downplaying salvation because everybody's just going to heaven because there is no lake of fire. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches there is a lake of fire, and the only way to stay out of it is to believe the gospel. Now, again, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, this is a little bit of repeat, but these are the verses that are so important. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. And the word gospel means good news. So he said, Paul says, I'm going to give you the good news, which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. This is the entrance into the dispensation of grace, the gospel. If you do not believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again, you are not saved. Now, a lot of people have modified the gospel. You've all heard this. Well, you have to trust in Jesus. Now, does that mean that you believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again? It might. But it might not. Trust what about Jesus? Well, trust that he's God. Sorry, you're not saved. I like that. You know, you need to believe in God. Okay, that's nice. Uh, that's still not the salvation message. Okay. You have to ask Jesus into your heart. Okay. What does that even mean? Okay. See, you have to get it. Am I being picky? Yeah. Why am I being picky? There's only one way to be saved today, and you better have it right. Because wiggling around the corners does not save you. Well, you had good intentions. No, either you believe it or you don't. If you're not trusting in Christ alone, you're not saved. The number one thing people tell me when I explain salvation to them about Christ alone, they always tell me, oh, I believe that too. Okay, no, you need to believe that one. <laughs> okay, because <laughs> two is, you know, also. They just got through telling about all the good things they were doing, and then they're telling me, and they're also trusting Christ but they're not trusting Christ alone. They're trusting that they have to help Christ. Folks, Christ doesn't need our help. If we would have needed our help, God would have said, do it yourself. Help yourself. Well, that, we can't. That's why Christ died on the cross. By which also you are saved, what? If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. So this is really important. What is it? For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ, what? Died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Now, again, I said last week, this is Old Testament scriptures, okay? The, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not the mystery. It was found in the Old Testament. Now, it was kind of cloudy. It was kind of vague. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, but it was there. So that's not the mystery, but it definitely is the gospel, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, again, according to the scriptures. That is our gospel. 
<clears throat> All right, 1 Corinthians 2. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. But we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, which came to not. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. So again, we move now from, and this we were talking about last week, now that we're saved, what exactly is the mystery? Because a lot of people don't really understand what's the part that's so secretive. Well, we see here, and we talked about this in Sunday school a little bit too, the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto his glory. It wasn't that God didn't know about the mystery. It was that God wasn't talking about it. Has anybody ever asked you to keep a secret? Okay. Yeah. How long do you have to keep that secret for? Well, it depends, right? Okay. Um, I always tell you, if, if you're pregnant, don't tell me. Why? Because i got a big mouth, and I'll tell somebody. Um, uh, you know, when Kristen was pregnant the first time, I found out before a, a family member did. And what did you tell me, Robin? Open don't open your mouth. Well, what, how dare you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, she knows me. Don't open your mouth. But was that still a secret? <laughs> no, what happened? <laughs> Finally, it became known. So when we start talking about the mystery, is the mystery still a secret? No. Do we have a secret handshake? We should have one, Scott. <laughs> Just for our church. <laughs> it's all known. It was only a mystery until Christ died on the cross. After that, we could talk about all we want. Now, again, nobody knew about it until God told Paul. How long did God know about it? You guys know? from the foundation of the world. God knew about it, but he wasn't telling anybody. Well, why wasn't he telling anybody? What damage could it have done? Well, it tells right here. If the princes of this world, which is Satan, which has to do with the mystery, would have known it, which is the true meaning of the cross, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So somehow the crucifixion of Christ did damage to Satan and did damage to his ultimate goal. Now, what is Satan's ultimate goal? Or... He probably still is. Yeah, he wanted to be just like God. I've heard a pastor once say, well, he didn't really want to take God out. He just wanted to co-rule co with him, you know. We'll have two kings, okay. Does that ever work? You know, does that ever work to have two wives? <laughs> well, why not? <laughs> what happens when two are in charge? <laughs> does it create chaos? How would that have worked if Satan and God would both been running the universe? Think that would have been really good? No, no. So the cross of Christ somehow was the downfall of Satan. And what I'm going to show you this morning was Satan lost his authority, his position, and his power because of the cross of Christ. God had to take that away from him. In Ephesians 3, Paul says, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, Whereby, when you read, you may understand my mystery, my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So it has to do with what's going on behind the scenes of Christ and his death, his burial, and resurrection, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs in the same body and partakers of his promise, how? In Christ, by the gospel. So the entrance fee into the mystery, the entrance price is the gospel, which is that Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried and rose again. And once you believe that, what does that give you? All those hundred things that, you know. Paul says we have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Does anybody know what all those blessings are? Give me a quick rundown. Yeah, yeah, that's why I said someone said there's a hundred. There's probably more than a hundred. All that happened at the moment of salvation, whether you understood it or not. That's our blessings. But what, what, what was the deal with Satan? Because that's the issue more than anything else, okay? And then Paul says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all the saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles, what, the unsearchable riches of Christ. So that's what we have going on here. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things in Christ Jesus. Now, to the intent that now unto these principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Halfway through the tribulation, and I'm going to show you this verse. Satan is kicked out of heaven. Okay, you know that? 
Where, did, where does Satan go when God kicks him out of heaven? Does anybody remember? No, not yet. First he has a stop off on the earth. And not only him, but all of his angels. Now, how many angels fell with Satan? Anybody know? A third. Well, that, that's kind of vague. Give me a number. Don't know. You think it's more than 100? <laughs> I, I don't know. I think it's a lot more than we think, but it's a third, okay? So it's interesting. All right, Ephesians 1.19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him on his own right hand in heavenly places? If someone were to ask you to write down some of your blessings, okay, your heavenly blessings. What kind of things would you put down? Anybody know? Eternal life, I think you said James, yeah. Anything else? So, well, sorry, what? A good, a good Yeah. <laughs> a tennis court. <clears throat> I don't know if that's one of them. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Joe wants a mansion in heaven with a really nice tennis court. Is it going to be um, blacktop or grass court? What are you, what are you going for? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him the dead and set him on his own right hand in heavenly places. You ever been to a, a wedding and they have in the front, they have what's called the what? The head table. Who gets to sit at the head table? The wedding party. When, when Kurt got married, they had name tags on them um, for everybody to sit. And... Um, I didn't even bother looking at the head table because <laughs> I knew Robin. <laughs> she was in charge of seating. You know where Robin put me? <laughs> she put me in a corner where I would stay out of trouble. <laughs> so, anyways, guess what? When you get to heaven, you know where we're sitting? We're at the head table, right next to Jesus. And that all, not only is that physically, but it's also positionally. You know what that means? We're going to have a lot of power. That, that's how amazing we are as members of the body of Christ, is, is we've been raised up above the angels, and we're sitting with Christ, and, and he's given us all these blessings. Now, what did we do to deserve or earn those? Nothing. It's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. Far above all principalities and powers and mights and dominions. Now, that's talking about position and power. Remember I said the body of Christ is above the angels? The angelic realm or the spiritual realm is these principalities and powers and mights and dominions. That's like saying, well, there's local government and there's county government and then there's state government and there's federal government. That's what principalities and powers and mights and dominions are. The body of Christ is positionally above them. So we're, we're the bosses of the bosses of the bosses more than anything else. Um, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet. Now again, that has to do with power. You know, if, if everything is under your feet, it means what? You're the boss. You're in charge. So when we're raised up, everything's under our feet too. And gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So it doesn't get any better, okay? Now, Paul goes on in Philippians 2, verse 5. He said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So what, what Paul is saying there is, I want you guys to start thinking about this heavenly realm. I want you to start thinking about our position in the heavenly realm and think about what Christ did, because that's going to be us someday, okay? Let this mind be in you, which also is in Christ Jesus. Or think like Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, which means what? Jesus and God are the same, okay? And that's what got the Jews all mad when Christ was walking around on the earth because he said he was God, and they went, no, you're not. Well, they said, yes, I am. But made himself, this is Christ, made himself of no reputation. Now, how do you make yourself of no reputation? You become mankind, <laughs> okay? That's, that's not moving up the food chain, it's moving down, okay? Made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. When Christ came to earth as a baby, he came and was called a suffering servant. Now, what's one of the characteristics of a suffering servant? Think about the word suffering. He what? He let people abuse him, didn't he? You know, did, did, did people beat Christ up? Did people kill him? Did people hang him on a cross? Yeah. Why did Christ let people do that to him? He was God. Couldn't he have stopped it? Yes, he could have. 
Why didn't he? Well, someone said it. What? It was, it was mission. He came as a suffering servant. He suffered so we didn't have to. He took our place, our punishment, when he died on that cross. Now, when Christ comes back the second time, now I'm not talking about the rapture, when he comes back to set up his kingdom, is Christ coming back as a suffering servant when he comes and sets his kingdom up? The answer is no, he's not. He's coming back as a righteous judge. Would you like to go to court before a righteous judge? Only if you're innocent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. What's wrong with righteous judges? They have no gray, folks. They have black or white. If a sinner stands before a righteous judge, is God going to be lenient with them? No. They're headed to the lake of fire. So remember that. He's not coming back as this cuddly little teddy bear the second time. He's coming back as a righteous judge who has a sword in his mouth, which means he's coming back in judgment. So be aware of that, okay? So Christ finds himself as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, because that was the only way to fix our problem, okay? Now we're going to start to see what's going on behind the scenes. Wherefore, God hath also highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name. He's talking about Christ after his death and burial and resurrection, okay? That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things, where? In heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Okay, now, well, last time I checked, I'm probably in this category. I'm in the, in the earth category. What in the world is in the heavens? Anybody know? What's he talking about? I thought those people in heaven always liked him. Who in heaven didn't like Jesus? Satan and his angels. Okay? This is God taking the power back in the heavenly realm after the cross. This is Satan losing his power and becoming an obedient servant because he lost his power. How about under the earth? When's the last time? If you dig a hole into the middle of the earth, what do you think we're going to find? And don't say molten rock. <laughs> what do you think is in the middle of the earth? as far as a spiritual realm, I think. I think there's angels tied up in darkness in the middle of the earth. I think that's where Abraham's bosom is. I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's where all of those you know, lost people are. And I think that's in Jude where it talks about angels which kept not their first estate, where they were put in chains of darkness. And I think those, those are in there. So this is about power. The name of Jesus, every knee should bow. There was a time when every knee didn't bow. But after the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ, these guys became obedient more than anything else. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about different types of beings. And I think that's something we have to remember. We are going to go to heaven. All right? Now, when, when astronauts go up in the space, what's the first thing they have to put on? A space suit. Why do they have to put a space suit on? Anybody know? Because how long would they last in heaven? Or in space, let's say. Not too long. Now here's the question, and I don't have the total answer, but I have an idea. Is there a difference between a heavenly being and the earthly being? Yes. I think there is. So is it fair to say that the kingdom saints who are going to be here on earth are going to have a different type of body than the body of Christ is going to have, which is in the heavenly realm? I think there is. Now, there's a lot of passages that go, no, it's the same. I am not quite sure. I really am not quite sure. I think there's going to be a slight difference. And I think Paul points that out here in 1 Corinthians 15. But some men will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body that shall be, but bare grain may have chance wheat or some other grain. When you plant a, a seed in the ground, does a big giant seed come out of the ground? <laughs> no, a plant grows out of it, right? So when you, and this is, sometimes these illustrations break down real quickly. After you die and I plant you in the ground, <laughs> what's going to grow out of that? <laughs> Nothing. But what's going to happen at the resurrection is what Paul is talking about, okay? God giveth a body as it hath pleased him to every seed his own body. Now, what's he, what's he saying there? Okay, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another kind of flesh of beasts, another kind of flesh of fishes, another kind of birds. All right, well, that makes sense. But here's the part. There also is celestial bodies 
and bodies terrestrial. So what Paul is saying is there's heavenly bodies and there's earthly bodies. And I think he's talking there about our final bodies. Kingdom saints are going to be raised and have a earthly body. During the kingdom, is there going to be gravity here on earth? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, and I don't even know the answer to this, do you think a resurrected kingdom saint is going to have to eat? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I'm not, I don't, I don't think so, but I think they can eat if they want to. Does that make sense? Remember Christ when he was resurrected? He ate. They also touched him. But yet he walked through a wall. You ever tried that one, walking through a wall? It didn't work. Don't work. Okay. Now, that's a physical body. Now, we're going to be up in heaven. You know, what about us? Do we have to eat? I don't think so. Okay. Can people touch us? I assume so. I don't know, okay? But when Paul makes a distinction between celestial and terrestrial, he's trying to make a distinction, isn't he? Obviously, he'd say, we're all the same, okay? Now, Paul does say our body can be like fashion, like unto Christ. That's a vague term, so I have no problem with that. So I think there's two types of resurrected bodies, okay? The glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is one. That, that makes sense to me, a kingdom hope and an earthly hope. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, one star different from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So again, we're, we're, we die in a natural body, but we're resurrected. We have a spiritual body. What does that even mean? Okay. Now I do know this. Has a rapture occurred yet? Nope. When's it going to occur? Tomorrow what time? One... <laughs> no, no. One fifth. When's the total darkness, Scott? When, when are you taking your glasses off? Oh, two o'clock. <laughs> I'm going to hear you all about it. I took my glasses off and then the sun, like, ah! <laughs> so, two o'clock. Um, if the rapture would occur tomorrow at two, what happens at that moment for those who have died already? They now get their what? They're resurrected bodies. Well, they already died. Paul says that at the moment of death, you're in the presence of the Lord. But what are, what are the, those who died already, what are they missing? They're resurrected bodies. So even though they're in heaven, they don't have their resurrected bodies yet. They don't get their bodies until the rapture occurs. Now, they get theirs first, but it's going to be boom, boom. Okay? Those who have died are in the presence of the Lord. And I think in 2 Corinthians, Paul uses the word naked there, okay, being found naked. I don't think he's talking about no clothes. I think he's talking about no body, okay? Now, is it possible to exist in heaven without a spiritual body? Uh, obviously. Now, Floyd Baker always taught about an intermediate temporary body. He taught me that. And I looked at him and I went, show me in the Bible. <laughs> I can't find it. Okay, if it makes you feel good, sure. I don't think so. We're going to get a new spiritual body at the rapture. They're coming, they're, they're coming back with Christ. We're going to get taken up with them. So it happens tomorrow, that's what's going to happen. But there's a natural body and there is a spiritual body. <clears throat> now, 1 Corinthians 6. Dare any of you have any matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Paul is talking here about the two groups of people again. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Now, you look at that and they go, oh, okay. He's talking about us. And I'm like, no, he's not. Okay, He's talking about Old Testament kingdom people or kingdom saints. Kingdom saints are going to judge the world. Remember, what did Christ tell the 12 disciples? They're going to sit on 12 thrones judging what? The 12 tribes. Where? In heaven? In Israel. Where's that at? On earth, right? Does that have anything to do with you and me? No. Where are we at that time? We're in heaven. Okay? All right. Okay, ye, okay, now, know ye not that we, is there a difference between um, the saints, which is up there, the saints shall judge the world, and he says that we shall judge angels? You think he's drawing attention to two different groups? Which group is Paul then? He's in the angel one, okay? Where are angels? In heaven, okay? Now again, judge does not mean innocent or guilty. God took care of that way back when Satan rebelled. What does it mean to judge? 
It means to rule over. The body of Christ is above the angelic realm. We become bosses. That's what he's talking about. But I see a big distinction here between kingdom saints and the body of Christ. He goes, hey, kingdom saints, because again, the Corinthian church had both groups in them. Because Paul went into the synagogue and brought a bunch of them over and they still had their kingdom hope. So he was telling them, hey, you guys are going to you know, stay on the earth and you're going to rule over the world. But the body of Christ, they're going to heaven and they're going to rule over angels. Okay, How much more things that pertain to this life. Now, to show you the difference between what life was like for angels before Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, we're going to go to the book of Daniel, verses after. Daniel had a vision, okay? And God sent an angel to answer Daniel's question. Now, that, that was Daniel. God's not sending angels to talk to you. Today, you have the completed word of God. But Daniel had a question. It says, And Daniel also saw the vision, for the men that were with him saw not the vision, but a great quake fell upon them, so that they fled hid themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remaineth no strength in me. My comeliness was turned into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the voice of the words, and I heard the voice of the words then, was I in a deep sleep in my face, and my face towards the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hand. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a great beloved, understand the words that I spake unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent that when I have spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy word was heard, and I am come for thy word. So he's saying, hey, the first time that you had questions, I was sent to tell you what's going on. But what happened? But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in twenty days. So as this angel was coming to tell Daniel what's going on, the prince of Persia said, stop, halt, you're not going past me. Now, the question is, who is the prince of Persia? Anybody know? It's probably Satan, okay? So this angel is stopped by Satan. Now, since when do angels have to listen to Satan? Well... Since Adam sinned, now angels have what? Authority. Al runs a farm. And uh, Alan tells one of his employees to um, do something. And uh, they go look at him and go, who are you? What does he say to him? I'm your boss. <laughs> and they go, I don't care. And what does he say next? Bah. bah. <laughs> you are a mean boss, Alan. <laughs> now, is there a rank in a business? Yeah, I always told my employees, if you want to sign a contract or a loan and, and be the boss, I'll come work for you. But until then, I'm the boss, okay? And that's just how life works. In the heavenly realm, there's levels of authority. Up until the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Satan was probably number four or, or three or two within the heavenly realm. Which even though he was corrupt, the lower angels still had to listen to him. So this angel's coming to talk to Daniel. It must have been just a you know, regular angel. Okay, and he shows up and he says, hey, you know what? For 21 days, I was not allowed to proceed because I couldn't, because that would have been breaking authority. Um, <clears throat> but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, you know, that's probably God's number one right-hand man, okay, um, helped me and I retained there with the kings of Persia. Now I come to make thee understand what thou befall the people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. So, Michael comes along and says, <clears throat> excuse me, let the man pass. And what does Satan have to do? He has to listen because Michael outranks him. So we have Satan's power in the heavenly realm. Do you think that would cause chaos in the heavenly realm if you had Satan who had ulterior motives adding his power with a third of the angels causing trouble? I'd say, yeah. I would say the heavens were in disarray, okay? Now, Revelation 20. Now, this is halfway through the tribulation, we talked about this earlier, has the, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ occurred now in Revelation 20? He goes, yeah, a long time ago, okay. Daniel took place before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Revelation 20, it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan and bound him a thousand years. It seems as though any old angel, one of God's angels, 
grabs Satan, lets him put a chain on him, and throws him into the bottomless pit. Well, why did Satan go willingly? Anybody know? I mean, you think he would have put up a fight. Because what? He was outranked. He had to do it. Any old angel now outranks Satan. Now, I said earlier, halfway through the uh, tribulation, there's a war in heaven. And Satan loses and he gets cast down the earth. Anybody know how angels fight? <laughs> what do you think they use to fight with? Guns? Lasers? <laughs> What's that? What's that thing on Star Wars? The uh, lightsaber. Think he used lightsabers? That sounds more. Proton guns. Well, how do how do angels fight each other? I don't know. It almost seems like God said it and it's done. You know, I, I don't think there's anything physical going on. It's like a ranking thing. So God just says, it says a war in heaven. I mean, they left, but I don't think they wanted to go. God just said, get out of my heaven, and I think He sent them to the earth. I, I have no idea how angels fight. Okay. So Satan is thrown into this bottomless pit. And I, I do think what happens is, it's called chains of darkness. Without God's presence, can anything exist? I think Satan is thrown in this, this pit where God's presence is not allowed in, and he just kind of loses his power because God is not there. I think that's what's going on there. Again, Revelation 12, 7, there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought his angels and prevailed not, neither was there found place anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. This takes place halfway through the tribulation. At that point, God puts up a sign that says what? Help wanted. <laughs> Who is the replacement for the fallen angels? The body of Christ. But again, we're not just replacement for fallen angels. We now become the, the bosses. Okay? So that is what goes on halfway through the tribulation. People say that, well, the reason that this doesn't happen right away is because the first thing that happens once we get to heaven is we have the judgment seat of Christ. And that takes about three and a half years. And then finally God has something for us to do. Um, do you really think the judgment seat of Christ will take three and a half years? I think it'll be like, like that, okay? I, I don't think it, it's going to take that long. But either way, that is when our job is now available because we're not going to be working with fallen angels. We're going to be working with you know, angels who didn't fall, I guess you could say. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuses them before our God day and night. Do you think heaven is still in a little bit of chaos even after the cross? Yeah. You know, you got Satan up there causing all kinds of trouble. So finally God kicks him out, and now we have peace in heaven, and the body of Christ takes over. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe unto the inhabitants of earth and to the seal, sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Um, do you think when Satan is cast here into the earth and all of his angels, he's going to be happy about that? <laughs> the first half of the tribulation, people always say, that's the good half. Okay, remember, Satan isn't cast out till halfway through. And the last half is called what? The great tribulation. You know, the first half, about one-third to one-half of the world's population is annihilated. That's the good half. <laughs> it's like, really? Yeah. <laughs> That's the good half. The second half is when the earth is just blowing up and everything's going crazy and there's dragons and people just want to die and rocks and earthquakes and the, the sun is darkened and it's just going to be terrible. My Bible tells me that unless the days be shortened, what? All flesh would perish. You see, when Satan's down here, he has one goal, and that's like, let's just kill everyone. <laughs> Why does Satan want mankind dead? Anybody know? If, God, if Satan can kill off mankind, what does that make God? It makes God a liar. Because what did God promise, you know, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? That he would establish a kingdom through them. If there's no Jews, there's no kingdom. 
Now, again, God has things in place. He seals 144,000. I see things happening, but it's be very, very interesting. Um, Ephesians 1.10, Paul says, In dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. People look at this verse and they say, the dispensation of the fullness of times is a final dispensation when God is going to take the heavenly realm and the earthly realm, and we're all going to come together and we're all going to finally be together and live happily ever after together. And I look at that and I go, God went through all this work of separating these two programs, and now he's just going to throw it together. What a waste of time. And I say, well, then what does it mean? Well, I think it means something different. The dispensation of the fullness of times is a word used when the dispensation of grace is finally complete. Because is the dispensation of grace complete today? No, it's still going on. But we're kind of separated, right? Those who are saved and have died, where are they right now? They're in heaven. Those who um, are saved and not dead, where are we? We're here on earth. So when the dispensation of grace is finally finished, God's going to gather together what? In one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, those who have died already, and which are on earth, that would be us, we're still alive today, and we're all going to be together. And after Christ comes back at the rapture and we all get our resurrected bodies, where are we going to go? Are we going to stay here on earth? No, we're going where? Back up to heaven. What are we going to do there? Rule angels. For how long? Forever. Now, people are like, well... Can I visit the earth? Can, can I hang out on the earth during the, the thousand years? Can, can I hang out during the eternal kingdom? What do you want me to say? <laughs> what do you think, Scott? <laughs> if it makes you feel good, sure. I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. But here's the thing. Um, if you go on vacation, after you're on vacation for a while, what, where do you eventually want to do? You want to go back home. Okay, my mom loves Florida, but she always wants to go back home. And how much snow do you have in Wisconsin, Allen? Yesterday, six inches. Last week. Last week, yeah, yeah. And my mom wants to go home. <laughs> how warm was it in Florida last week? Eighty-five. Yeah. Okay. All right. Even if we can visit, I think we're going to want to go back home. <laughs> okay. But you tell me. I mean, there's so many things that we because we're stuck in these bodies. We let all these emotions get involved? I don't know. No. There was a lady in Florida that told me that the first thing she's going to do when she gets to heaven is get in line. And I'm like, get in line? Well, I have a lot of questions for Jesus. Okay. <laughs> I said, enjoy the line. Once I get to heaven, I'm going to have the mind of Christ. I'm going to know the answers. Okay? And then I'm probably going to laugh at myself and go, how could you be so stupid? You know? And then I'm going to go up to James and say, I told you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what it is. Because we won't have pride in heaven, we can't even do that. You know, we're all going to be happy. There's no such thing. There's no such, nothing in scripture that says it's going to be a question and answer session. Uh, no, you know, people like that. I say, hey, if you want to go stand in line, go ahead. I think we're going to know everything. And, um, and because we're going to be finally 100% Christ like in body, soul, and spirit, things are going to be great. I just think things are going to be so amazing. So understand. The chaos started with the fall of Satan. The fix for the earth is the kingdom saints. The fix for the heavenly is the body of Christ. And I just like to see them separate. But the issue of the mystery is it took Satan out of the way. That, that was a big mess for God. And Satan, if Satan would have saw it coming, I'll guarantee you, he never would have let it happen. It's the ultimate you know, trick play, I guess you could say of anything else. Satan was like, okay, okay, and all of a sudden, boom, it was his own downfall. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for salvation. Lord, you took our place, our punishment. Lord, you fixed us. And all we have to do is just believe. And we're sealed, signed, delivered forever. We thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you for that love. We pray us in your name. Amen. Amen. All righty, folks.